Ciao. Here is a conversation with Jean-Philippe Bouchot. Dr. Bouchot, a statistical physicist, is a pioneer in econophysics, a research field applying theories and methods originally developed by physicists in order to solve problems in economics, usually those including uncertainty or stochastic processes and nonlinear dynamics. He is the co-founder and chairman of Capital Fund Management, a global asset management using quantitative and scientific approaches to financial markets to invest billions of dollars in a systematic way. He is also the head of research of CFM and professor at Ecole Normale Supérieure. We talk about how ideas in dynamical systems theory and complex systems theory, like the ones developed by the 2021 Physics Nobel Prize Giorgio Parisi, but also by Michael Fisher and Benoit Mendelbrot, influenced him. We talk about fat tails, levy flights, and their emergence in both physical and financial systems. We talk about diffusion phenomena, fractional Brownian motion, hyperchaos, the Hearst exponent, and their application in finance. We touch on the wisdom of crowds, the emergence of intelligence in complex systems, their relations with the efficient market hypothesis, and the limits of a Markovian modeling of the financial market. We also try to inform policy making, both aiming at an optimal level of inequality in society and dealing with systematic incentives to push against what Brett Weinstein calls the personal responsibility vortex, the fourth criticizing the invisible hand idea by Adam Smith. We close with the use of artificial intelligence techniques in finance, focusing on the relation between deep learning, kernel methods, and random matrix theory. I hope you enjoy it. To support this project, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, connect with me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and support me on Patreon with a monthly membership, following the links in the description. Thank you again for joining this conversation. I'd like to start asking you about your background uh, because, you know, I, I discovered your work looking into uh, basically, uh, at least from my perspective, coming from a data-driven dynamical system perspective uh, and then going deep into some physics ideas in economics. And so then I discovered this, this field called econophysics. So mm -hmm. if you could uh, tell us a bit about your background, so what did you study? Uh, what is econophysics and uh, how and when did this discipline emerge and with what uh, aims, let's say? Yes, exactly. So um, I was trained as a statistical physicist um, back in the 80s. Um, and so I was witnessing um the rise of um, uh, dynamical system theory and and also complex system theory mm -hmm. with uh, many interesting ideas at the time you know for example the ideas of Giorgio Parisi's on mm -hmm. um, on spin glasses uh, uh, the trend towards uh, uh, the study of, of physical systems that show interesting behavior like intermittent behavior, mm -hmm. turbulence, avalanches and earth earthquakes, all these things where a very small cause can lead to an enormous effect or not. And I think that's a definition of complex system that mm -hmm. there is no clear relation between the cause and the effect. The cause okay. is small and the effect can be tremendous, but can be small as well. And, and there's no way to a priori know whether a grain of sand is going to trigger a full-blown avalanche or if it's going to just, you know, stop and do nothing. So all these ideas were maturing and there was a very strong trend in, back then. Also, you know, non-Gaussian statistics, and this was actually my field, non-Brownian uh, dynamics. Mm -hmm. It's called Levy flights. So... Mm -hmm. uh, diffusion where sometimes the particle decides to make a very long jump that dominate all the rest mm -hmm. um, and therefore changes the diffusion laws. And, um, and we actually discovered at Ecole Normale uh, when I, where I was there then uh, working in the, in the physics lab, um, there was an experimental discovery of these Levy flights, and I was fortunate to be part of the interpretation of these experiments. Mm. And um, in parallel, I, I always had the feeling that uh, all these ideas had interesting applications in economics and finance. I've always been interested in economics and finance, although I've never uh, you know, was exposed to them at a formal level. But somehow in the back of my mind, I've always thought that um, 
these ideas could be applied. And then what happened in um, a little bit after the 1987 crash, we published this paper on Levy flights in, in a physical system, in a soft matter system. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was contacted by uh, someone called Christian Walter, who had been interested in the work of Mandelbrot uh, on, on these, you know, large events, fat tails and anomalous diffusion in financial systems as well. Mm -hmm. And so he read, he read the paper on the physics system and said, hey, uh, it's really interesting because the same kind of phenomenon appears also in financial markets. And so we started discussing. He showed me the paper of, of Black and Scholes on option pricing. And it's, it, it started the whole thing for me. Um, and surprisingly, in parallel, other people like uh, Rosario Montaigne uh, in Palermo um, started studying uh, the statistics of financial markets using these physics tools. And, and so that's how the, this field of econophysics uh, emerged through these different people who had all been trained with the same uh, background, the statistical mechanics, mm -hmm. and had the same feeling that um, the ideas that come up, um, like, as I said, the, these complex system ideas, but also the whole field of phase transitions, of uh, nonlinear effects, of feedback loops, and all that. Uh, I think it was the moment where the field was really mature to, uh, to emerge. But at the time, I think econophysics was a, a little bit of a misnomer in the sense that it was more about financial markets than about e economics mm -hmm. uh, per se. And it's only more recently, I think, that um, that this crowd of econophysicists has, has really become interested in in bona fide uh, macroeconomics mm -hmm. or economic systems. Right. Okay. Uh, interesting. And can you expand a bit on the experiment uh, you, you validated about levy flight prior to the interest in economics? Yeah, I mean, it's a strange system. It's a, it's a system called living polymers. So a polymer is, is a long chain of molecules that is usually you know, fixed once and for all. Uh, the, the chain cannot spontaneously cut itself. Right. But you can create systems with a, uh, soft matter systems where you actually create filaments that are much more fragile and these filaments can break and recombine all the time. So that's why they are called living polymers in mm -hmm. the sense that they, they, they don't live, obviously, but they, they, they have a, a dynamics. And what happens in polymer physics is that if you have a, a very short chain, it diffuses quickly. But if you have a long chain, then it's entangled in other chains and it has to reptate. That's a, a notion introduced by uh, Pierre-Gilles de Gênes, who... Um, is, is, was one of my heroes and is still very much in my mind all the time. Um, and so the long chains, they diffuse much more slowly. And so if you put a tracer molecule on these polymers, there will be sometimes on a short rapid chain that is going to make a long jump because it's mm -hmm. quick. And sometimes in a very long chain where it's not going to diffuse much at all. And so if you look at the statistics of jumps, between moments where the chain breaks and recombine, you find that the statistics of jumps is, has actually a, a power law tail mm -hmm. that prevents the second moment of the distribution of jumps to uh, converge formally. I mean, mathematically, the, the, the second moment diverges, and that's the definition of a, of a Levy flight. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit of an exotic system, mm -hmm. but what was um, really nice is that the experimental signature was extremely clear-cut. And so there was no doubt it was anomalous diffusion. And you know, I had studied these systems for a while before the experiment was done, but the experiment was not done you know, on purpose to look for these Levy flights. Right. It was just other, another group working on, on these living polymers that came up to me because they knew I was interested in anomalous diffusion. And they showed the results and they said we don't understand we should find an exponent one half and we find an exponent greater than one half what's going on and you know i was fortunate enough to have enough uh, 
background in these problems to come up with a plausible interpretation in terms of what I said, the fact that uh, these systems, they have a very broad distribution of, of diffusion coefficients, if you want, mm -hmm. and therefore that the Levy flight interpretation was uh, highly plausible. Right. Okay. Uh, not sure if this makes sense as a question, but uh, I've been looking into, uh, again, the relation between dynamical systems. I'm a en aerospace engineer, so I have, I'm not a complex system person, but I, I did something on dynamical systems and particularly chaos. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, you mentioned fat tails, uh, hyper diffusion, you call it, uh, super diffusion. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, super diffusion. Yeah, so it, it, in my field, usually people use uh, what's called the Lyapunov exponent, the uh, Lyapunov indicator to, to identify chaos. Uh, but also, uh, uh, my old supervisor was interested in the Hurst exponent, which is somehow associated to hyper chaos. Yes. Is yes, this, yes, well, is this yes. related to yes, fat tails? Yes, it's very related. Well, Hurst, uh, anomalous Hurst exponent can be either related to fat tails or related to long memory. Uh, okay. So you can have an anomalous Hurst exponent so the usual house exponent is one half. This is the random wall. But you can have house exponents greater than one half. This is super diffusion or less than one half. This is sub diffusion. And in the case of super diffusion, it can be due either to fat tails in the distribution of individual jumps mm -hmm. or to um, long memory. The fact that you know the, the, the particle somehow doesn't make long jumps, but it still goes in the same direction for a long time because it remembers its past direction. There's okay. some kind of inertia, if you want. Uh -huh. But yes, I mean, this, this classification actually dates back to Mandelbrot. Uh, Mandelbrot worked a lot on these issues and, uh, and proposed models for anomalous diffusion based on, on these two phenomena. One is fat tails and Levy flies, and the other one is what Mandelbrot called the fractional Brownian motion. Uh -huh. And actually, okay. interestingly, all these things were also in our bag of tools, so to say. And, uh, and these ideas of fractional Brownian motion have become extremely important in, in, in for financial modeling as well. And nowadays, people believe that uh, um, uh, the volatility, which is the, the typical uh, amplitude of fluctuation of stock markets on a given day. So it, it doesn't tell you whether the market goes up or down. It just tells you, is it going to go up or down uh, very much mm -hmm. or very little? Um, then the volatility itself, actually the log of the volatility, is very well modeled by a fractional Brownian motion with a Hurst exponent very close to zero. So, you know, in the sub diffusion side. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it's it's it's, a, it's still a developing uh, field with new ideas and new models and 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 I think in a sense uh, what's missing now and where statistical physicists may play a role in the future is to try to have um, a, a model that explains why these features emerge. So I talked about the mechanism by which you know, you observe super diffusion in this uh, living polymers. Yeah. Uh, and what's interesting about the physics approach is that you're trying to find these mechanisms. You're not only satisfied by having a mathematical model like the fractional Brownian motion, you really want to understand why. And so I think now uh, what statistical physics physicists want to do in financial markets, but also in economics is to understand how Aggregate this aggregate effects, you know, like what happens on financial markets is is an aggregate effect because there's mm -hmm. a lot of people interacting. What happens at the in macro uh, econo economies is due to the fact that there's a lot of individual agents doing stuff. And what we want to understand is how come through interaction, through feedback loops, through uh, nonlinear phenomena, uh, you can observe these very anomalous features um, mm -hmm. that you observe in financial markets or in economics as a whole. Right. right. And okay. the, 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 the passage from micro to macro, I mean, the, 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 
the idea that you can aggregate simple elements and get a very complex behavior at the macro scale is really what statistical physicists have been you know, worried about for a century. Mm-hmm. And, and, and with a, a renewal of, uh, of all these concepts starting in, in, in the 70s or 80s uh, around you know, people I mentioned already, Giorgio Parisi, but also uh, Michael Fisher, who's another great physicist who just passed away a few days ago. That's why I'm mentioning him. But there's oh, a yeah. lot of, 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 of names who, are, who have been uh, very important in developing this idea of, uh, of complex systems, of fractals, of self-similarity, mm-hmm. of long-range behavior, of long-range correlations. You know, usually standard systems, both in physics and elsewhere, they are described by short-range correlations. So, you know, you're, you're only sensitive to what's around you and, and you don't have an effect that propagates over long distances or over long times. Mm-hmm. But in special conditions, and these conditions are called critical points in, in physics, then you, you can be in a situation where what you do affects people very, very far away from you and affects uh, the system for a very long time. And so you lose this, this standard notion of locality, both in space mm-hmm. and time, and, and, you, and, and some non-trivial behavior emerge from that. And so in physics, what happens is that you need to be very close to these critical points. So in a sense, it's not generic. You have to tune the system to, you know, be right on the critical point. So it, it's a little bit of a, of a singularity, if you want. It's, a, mm-hmm. it's an exotic situation. But then in the early 90s, uh, someone called Per Back came up with the idea that a lot of these complex systems that we've been talking about um, since the beginning of the interview, like sand piles or, or the, 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 earth, uh, the crust of, uh, of the earth, mm-hmm. They actually manage to stabilize at the border of a critical point. And this is the idea that he calls self-organized criticality, that somehow the dynamics drives you naturally uh, to a point that is a critical point. And so all of these you know, exotic behavior, all these non-local behavior that I just talked about, instead of being uh, very special cases, they could be thought of as actually very generic cases. Mm-hmm. And this is a very important idea because I, I, I believe that something like this is going on in, phys- in, in financial markets, but also in economics. Um, and the analogy is that, in a sense, if the system is, you know, people strive to optimize their wealth, they, they, they strive to you know, make the best guess about mm-hmm. the next, financial price move and so very often if you have a system that is trying to be optimal it's also at the edge of a of a of an instability and Mm -hmm. and so you you, it it might be much more generic than one thinks and and this if one can really justify this idea that economic systems and financial markets are close to an instability and there is a large number of empirical uh, proofs, I mean, not maybe not proofs, but indications that mm-hmm. something like this could be the case, I think this would be a, a fantastic success of econophysics, because I, I think at the beginning, this was the motivation. Mm-hmm. And by the way, um, there's an, another um, example where these ideas may be very important is the brain. People mm-hmm. now start to accumulate data showing that the brain is in a sense, a self-organized critical system. Mm -hmm. So it has features, you know, of of long-range temporal correlations and long-range spatial correlations. The neural, the the way that the uh, neural network, the true one, not the one that people (laughs) talk about (laughs) in in, in artificial intelligence, uh, is self-organizing in a critical state that allows it to be, in a sense, extremely efficient and flexible. Mm-hmm. So there's this duality between fragility and, and, and efficiency that seems to operate 
in many different contexts. And I, I think this is really a very exciting uh, moment in science. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a scary question, but let me ask it. Uh, so uh, uh, there's a philosopher, an American philosopher called Daniel Dennett that uh, makes the comparison between basically the, uh, the ant colony and the brain and talks about consciousness. So whether, how, how can you say that an individual is conscious and maybe an ant, an individual ant is not, but maybe the ant working collectively and creating this complex system, this structure mm -hmm. emerges and you have... Uh, so uh, what do you make of that in the sense uh, that do you ask this question like where yes. is what, what's consciousness Can, is a market intelligent is a... yes yes i think it's the same kind of question i mean you know neurons individual neurons have no intelligence and you start connecting these neurons together and you create the brain and you create consciousness so it's not very clear exactly when it emerges mm -hmm. and how it emerges but Clearly, this is related to this thing that I was talking about, that there is a, a, a gap between the micro level and the macro level. So mm -hmm. there are collective effects that belong to the macro level and that do, do not belong to any individuals. And I think that a lot of phenomena that happen in financial markets or economics as a whole is precisely about the emergence of these collective phenomena that are unexplainable at the individual level. So, mm. for example, you know, if you look at things like trivial things like uh, what we call la ola in, in France, maybe in Italy too, but it's called the Mexican wave in, in English. Ah, yeah, yes. Uh, and um, sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, so, so this is an emergent phenomenon, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, people on their own, they can't make a Mexican wave. They, they have to somehow coordinate and mm -hmm. this makes something that happens at the macro level that cannot be understood at, at the individual level. It really requires interactions and something specific. Actually, when you look at how a Mexican wave is formed, it's highly non-trivial because mm -hmm. you, you see these people trying to you know, nucleate the, the Mexican wave and it doesn't work. And so things go back to back down. And then at one point it starts. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you ask yourself um, the question of why, I mean, a priori, the Mexican wave could travel both clockwise or counterclockwise, mm -hmm. but it decides to propagate in one direction and not in the other. And, and so this symmetry breaking is really one of the signature of what physicists call collective effects and right. phase transitions is it's really the, the signature is that there was a priori a symmetry, but collectively the system decided to go one way or the other. And sometimes it's the same in financial markets that, um, you know, there's a news and it's not clear if the news is positive or negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can read the news both ways. Um, is it good? Is it bad? Uh, it's not clear. And you, can, you have arguments in both directions. But somehow, the market collectively decides that the news was positive or negative. It's mm -hmm. very interesting, very strange. Yeah. And so you all use that these was... ideas working, uh, because, because basically you're working in the uh, capital fund management, you're the chairman and head of research. Yes. Uh, I mean, does your everyday research goes touch touch these ideas well okay you know it's uh, yes in, in a sense yes and in a sense no in, in a sense yes because we're uh somehow embedded in this framework and we mm -hmm. try to think about markets so economists think about markets as purely revealing the fundamental value of a company for example or currency or so so the efficient market theory tells you that actually markets are perfect and they reveal uh the true value of a company through aggregation of the information of everybody in the market in the market and if you don't believe that you still sh should make your homework and try to you know come up with your best estimate of the fundamental value and trade 
according to this. So if, if right. the price is lower than what you estimate to be the fundamental value, you should buy and vice versa. But actually the fundamental value is, is so ill-defined in a way, there's so much uncertainty that this program is unfeasible. And this was already noticed by Keynes a long time ago, which replaced this idea of markets revealing the fundamental value by what he called the beauty contest. And probably you've heard about, about this. No. So he, he tried to explain phenomena in financial markets using um, the beauty contest analogy. So the beauty contest was a, a contest published in British newspapers in the 20s or 30s, where you had a, a number of uh, uh, females, you know, picture of females, and you should, the, the, the contest was that you had to vote for one of them, mm -hmm. so not very me too at the time, but uh, <laughs> you had to vote for one of them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and of course you would win if you were in the majority. I mean, if you pick the one that everybody else would think is the most beautiful. But of course, you know, faced with that problem, you shouldn't think, try to think about what woman you personally judge to be the most beautiful, you should think about what other people will think is the most beautiful. And actually, you should maybe even think at a second degree what other people will think other people mm -hmm. believe the most beautiful. So there's this, this kind of self-reflective phenomenon that uh, Keynes anticipated a long time ago. And I think he, he was right on that actually what happens in financial markets is very much a self-reflective phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, we, we so to come back to your question, the, the, the philosophy behind the type of research we're doing to try to create trading strategies is, is um, irrigated by, by these ideas. Mm -hmm. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we don't have a grand unification model mm -hmm. that allows you to, you know, uh, of course, I mean, we're more engineers from that point of view. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find things that work, but the, 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 uh, um, the motivation and, and the conceptual framework is uh, very much embedded in, in these concepts. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, I have a question about, again, uh, the efficiency of markets. Uh, so you mentioned basically the wisdom of crowds. We didn't touch this uh, mm -hmm. way of saying it, but yeah, we, we discussed this. Um, so the idea of market efficiency, uh, basically what uh, people are saying when looking at, for example, I don't know, uh, the Arema technique for, for regression or uh, the LSTM, long short-term memories, are mm -hmm. aiming at identifying... Uh, uh, a non-Markovian pattern in the data. And mm -hmm. so basically, they're getting rid of the efficient hypothesis. Mm -hmm. market hypothesis. That, that's the, sure. the overall idea. And so everything you're doing as well. Uh, yes. There, there's no efficiency. Yes. Because otherwise, no. you're just, you would just have a, a diffusive uh, yes. forecast. If, if markets were efficient, you know, you would just have to go home and buy, buy the index. I mean, have a yeah. passive money management but if you believe that somehow markets are not efficient in the sense that i mean you know you you could have a market that's very close to markovian random walk but still not reveal the fundamental value and so after a while there would be corrections because you know say and that was an idea that was developed by fisher black in the in the 80s he thought that, you know, he reduced the, very much the, 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 the strength of the efficient market hypothesis. He said, efficient markets are such that prices are within a factor of two of value. And so this leaves quite a, little, a, a bit of room for human behavior to um, kick prices around. And because humans kick prices around, they're going to leave uh, detectable patterns. Humans you know, do things according to patterns. There's a lot of regularities and a lot of um, uh, behavioral biases in, in what human, humans do. Humans tend to follow trends. 
mm-hmm. they trend, they 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 tend to believe that you know what happened in the past is going to continue in the future. So when they see a price going up, they don't exactly know why, but they are going to join the uh, the the bandwagon. Mm-hmm. And this, um, is, this, they this also could be a strongly... cause of uh, yes. the fat tail effect. The fat tail. Sure, sure, absolutely, exactly. And they also will tend to believe that others have uh, better information than what they have. So they will blindly follow others. And this can again lead to fat tails, to panics, to bank runs, to uh, things li- like this. So... Um, all these behavioral patterns, they leave traces in financial prices or also, you know, just seasonalities, regularities. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of regularities. Uh, I don't know, the Christmas period, uh, uh, the year is a periodicity, the week is a periodicity. There's a lot of things that people tend to do on a regular basis that leave traces to in, in prices. So if you look, you know, at a course level, the Markovian assumption is close to reality. But mm-hmm. if you start digging, you realize that there's an enormous amount of anomalies. And financial prices are actually very, very far from uh, Brownian motion, but even from a kind of Markovian chain that is unpredictable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And can we go back to the physics? Because uh, I basically encountered this fat tail phenomena, phenomenon. Uh, first in uh, finance, actually, I was looking into how to use the Kramers Moyal expansion, which I don't know if mm-hmm. you know, but basically sure. to, to to separate the drift from the diffusion of a time series, and then try to do some forecasting using that. And uh, there were some papers in the early 2000s applying this for the oil price and uh, detecting this fat tail distribution. And uh, after that, I discovered this. Uh, I mean, no, I, I, w- I had already been following the work of uh, Stephen Branton and his group uh, in the University of uh, Washington, in which basically is, is building a data-driven technique for, he calls it Langevin regression. So to do a data-driven reconstruction of stochastic processes um, and is applying it to a fluid dynamics problem mm-hmm. and is detecting basically the same empirical result that basically in turbulence, you have this fat tail. So I don't know... Mm-hmm. If, could it be possible to, to, to bring something from quantum physics and, and complex system in general to the understanding of turbulence in fluid dynamics? Yes, but I think this, this was one of the you know, big theme in the... Well, actually, Mandelbrot himself worked on, on turbulence and invented his models. Um, uh, a lot of, of these models that are now used for financial markets were invented by Mandelbrot and later by Parisi and Frisch uh, Mm -hmm. to describe turbulent flows. So there's been, there's a long tradition of, uh, you know, statistical physicists speaking with people from turbulence. Um, What's maybe newer is that now some of the models and methods that have been developed for financial markets Feedback on mm-hmm. uh, on the description of, of turbulence or of uh, another example on which I've worked on is the, the statistics of cracks. Actually, my wife worked on that for many years, but I've been interested in that through uh, the knowledge of financial markets because uh, you know with the, these models getting more and more uh, trendy in the financial literature, uh, there are um, properties of these um, of these stochastic phenomena that that people understand better now, and uh, they understand better how to what to look for. And so you can now go back to uh, physics systems and include uh, some of the features that have been useful to describe financial markets to describe physical systems. So it's really interesting to see that mm-hmm. the flow of ideas went from physics to finance. And now there, there's a, a kind of you know, backflow from, uh, from finance to physics as well. Right. Right. And do you think we could explain, for example, I was thinking about uh, whether these ideas could be applied, I don't know, for policy, policy making, for example. Could we explain the Pareto principle? I think you mentioned it in some of your works. Um, in terms of this uh, uh, 
uh, fat tails. Let's start, let's keep talking about. Uh, yeah, I mean, so so exactly, and so I think that here again, what's interesting is that statistical mechanics have thought a lot about fat tails and and mechanisms to generate fat tails, and um, and one of the most well-known fat tail is the Pareto fat tail, the, the fact that the wealth distribution has a, has a very fat tail. But there's a lot of other fat tails in economics. For example, if you look at the distribution of firm sizes, for example, the number of employees in a firm mm -hmm. or, you know, or, or maybe the sales of a firm, you find that it has a, a very fat tail. Um, and so one thing is to understand where these fat tail can come from and if you're on if, if you really understand the mechanism and you're happy with uh, your explanation you believe that it's based on something real then it opens the way to think about ways to limit mm -hmm. this uh, the, this heterogeneity because and but here there's a very you know difficult problem which is what is the optimal level of inequality you want to reach? Mm -hmm. I mean, one has a feeling that too much inequality is, is clearly not good, but too little inequality is not good either. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you so one obvious way to limit inequalities is, is tax mm -hmm. and in a particular wealth tax, but, you know, beyond engineering and i think that you know if we if we agreed on the level of inequality that we want to reach the level the fatness of the tail that we want right. to reach then i think it would be using these models it would be easy to come up with rules of thumb to uh fix the the you know the the, the type of tax rate do you want to impose on wealth to reduce inequalities but what is the target yeah, right. You know, what should be the target? I think it's it's a it's something highly non-trivial, but at least if you understand where these fat tails come from, it helps you thinking about about the problem. And so, one of the model that we proposed with uh, Marc Mezar uh, a long time ago, in two thousand, uh, was a purely stochastic model where you know people are just randomly lucky. But mm -hmm. if you're wealthy and lucky, you get even more wealthy. And so this is a mechanism by which you can generate fat tails very easily. Mm -hmm. um, and this model has had quite a, a bit of success. And actually, it was also discussed, but with a different point of view in the economics literature. There's a, there's a, there, there is a model that people use in economics to describe wealth inequalities that actually is extremely close to the one that we've proposed independently with uh, with Mark, uh, although it's justified by another type of uh, argument. But in the in the, in the end, it's the same model, uh, so the effect of tax would be the same. But here, I mean, for me, the, the the basic problem is okay. If people can become rich just because they're lucky, then clearly it makes sense to in, in, increase the tax. But maybe it's not the only reason why people get rich. People might also get rich because, I don't know, they've really invented something that changed the life of, of many people. But what is the level beyond which it becomes unacceptable? And I think this is beyond science. This right. uh, Maybe there's a way to frame it in a scientific fashion. Uh, but I think very, very soon you reach more politics or philosophy. And, and so something that maybe can be brought to a uh, more formal analysis is um, is John Rawls' uh, uh, criterion. Maybe you know John Rawls, mm -hmm. um, an American philosopher who who said that actually, uh, if the inequality is beneficial to everybody, then it is justified. Mm -hmm. So, if you reduce inequality, but because reducing inequality makes even the poorer the poor, poorer, mm -hmm. then it's not a good idea. So uh, this this is a this seems to be a, an intuitive criterion. You you want to promote inequalities as in so far as it allows poor people to get richer. Uh, and so maybe this is a guiding line to 
create a, a more mathematical model for this and mm -hmm. uh, and go one step further in that direction. But of course, you're treading on on delicate matters here because mm -hmm. uh, it's very you know it's very easy to flip to politics and and mm -hmm. prejudices rather than having a, a kind of neutral engineering type of approach mm -hmm. to the problem. But it's fascinating. I think it's it's super interesting. Yeah, to, to me, it's interesting to, to notice that uh, how, how shallow often people discuss about these matters, how shallowly, shallowly, how do you say? Uh, I mean, uh, for example, discussing this uh, quantitative uh, uh, phenomena that emerge from the complex systems mm -hmm. and just discuss. I mean, I, I think you uh, the science is not enough, but it's necessary. That's what I would say. Uh, to, to well, we see it now with the with the with the pandemic, right? That uh, science is necessary, but yeah. at one point, it's not enough. Yeah, it, right. You have to make political decisions, and that's something different. But I think that science should be there to inform as best as you can. And the problem with a lot of traditional theories in finance, like the efficient market theory, or you know, in economics, the idea that agents are infinitely rational and that, you know, by having a, a, infinitely rational agents, you reach uh, economies that are, in a sense, optimal, Pareto mm -hmm. optimal, that nobody can, you know, be better off without making someone else uh, uh, worse, worse off. I think this, this idea, if you want, of the invisible hand, of uh, Adam Smith's invisible mm -hmm. hand that tells you that if everybody works for his or her own benefit, then collectively everything is going to be okay. This is this is a political, very strong political prejudice, mm -hmm. and and there are a lot of counterexamples to that. You know, the, what one fantastic example was invented by Schelling, Thomas Schelling, who's an economist from the seventies. And he came up with a, a model that he, he invented to try to explain uh, segregation in U.S. cities, racial segregation. Mm -hmm. And what he showed is that, you know, in some cases, even when people want to live in well-mixed neighborhoods, they can make individual decisions that end up in a completely segregated environment, which is completely counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. But, but actually, what's nice about this shedding model is that you can map it to a physics model, the, 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 the model of uh, trans, the liquid gas transition, and it's the same mathematics. And what you find is that, you know, even if individuals want to do good, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. If they follow mm -hmm. rules that are too selfish in a way, then the whole, the, 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 the emergent collective phenomena doesn't at all reflect the individual preferences. And so, of course, it's a very simple model. It's, it, it's very far from being an accurate description of anything resembling a real city in the US. Mm -hmm. But it, it, I think it has a very strong uh, power. It's, it's a model that I like to call a, a metaphorical model. Mm -hmm. It tells you a story about something that is completely paradoxical in a way. But that shows that this idea of, of the invisible hand, uh, that you know, you should let people do whatever they want that's best for them, and collectively everything is going to be okay. This is completely misleading, mm -hmm. and uh, and if you defend that, you cannot. I, I don't think you can defend that idea from a purely scientific point of view because, as I said, the, the shedding model is is a blatant counterexample to this. On the other hand. Um, you know, if you continue promoting this idea, it means that some politics has invaded your scientific um, uh, description. Mm -hmm. I, I think really what is striking when you try to compare physics and economics or finance is that in, in physics, it's hard to, you know, to have politics creeping in the models. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense, of course, because of the subject. But in economics, it seems to me that a lot of models are not politically neutral. They're based on prejudices and they're not based on trying to model the world as it is and humans as they are. 
they mm. are just there are simplification about how humans are supposed to behave that makes simplifications that make mathematics much easier but that can be completely off uh the grid mm -hmm. yeah yeah and this i think says a lot about individual responsibility uh, i mean uh, overstating individual responsibilities for collective issues like i don't know uh climate change or even covid pandemic maybe uh it's it's good to think about systematic yes uh, exactly policies there are system incentive. systemic effects yeah exactly Incentives are very important because even small incentives can have a very strong effect at the global level. Right. Uh, so let me go back before uh, we close this chat. Lovely, by the way. I mean, I, I'm having so much fun. Uh, can we talk about uh, a bit the relation between econophysics and artificial intelligence? I mean, uh, are you in your daily work dealing with artificial intelligence techniques? Well, Yes, because you know now all these things called you know deep learning and and machine learning and and whatever deep networks they are part of uh, the standard toolbox of anyone who's looking at data. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not you know for me it's it's just another tool in the toolbox. It's not something that you should take for granted and use blindly because uh, in, in, it is true that is um, you know sometimes deep networks make extraordinary things like of course recognizing cats from dogs or or creating new images of people who don't exist um, and that you know these GAN these uh, adversarial networks mm -hmm. that are trained to there's, there's some there's one network trying to propose images to another and the, the aim is to fool the other network and so they both learn and at the end um, if the other network cannot distinguish a, a, a fake image from a real image then the process uh, has converged and then you can create these images that are not distinguishable from real images so this is really impressive but you know, all this is come, is still based on the fact that the assumption that there is some structure in the data that is maybe very nonlinear, very uh, difficult to describe mathematically, but also in a sense very obvious. I mean, uh, a three-year-old child can distinguish a dog from a cat. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's it's, whereas finance is is another problem because uh, um, there's much less data, except if you go to very high frequency finance, which is interesting on its own. And there, these uh, black boxes can can work and can help you uh, finding structure when it's very difficult to find it with the uh, standard tools. Uh, but on longer time scales, there's much less data Mm -hmm. So it's very, very difficult to train these networks and avoid overfitting. And, and there's, you know, as we argued earlier, to a fast approximation, the idea that markets are, as you said, Markovian or random orgs or mm -hmm. whatever, I mean, unpredictable, this is not such a wrong assumption. So what it means in practice is that the signal to noise ratio is extremely small. You know, in the image of a cat, the signal to noise ratio is extremely high. And so it's a very different problem. Uh, but having said that, uh, what is interesting is that sometimes, and for me, the best use of, of these neural networks is that it, it allows you to find structures that were not visible with the human eye necessarily, mm -hmm. and then to extract these structures from the network to try to understand what the network has learned mm -hmm. and simplify and reframe it. And, you know, sometimes what happens is that the network has learned something and, and then you can identify what it has learned and you say, aha, yes, of course, I haven't seen that, but it's pretty obvious now I see it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's really a tool like simulations. Simulations mm -hmm. help you discovering structures that you were not anticipating for example we talked about the the shedding model 
-hmm. So the Shenning model of segregation, you can code it on, on a computer with the rules that are very simple. And so when you start coding this model, you say, why am I coding this model? It's obvious what I'm going to find. Everybody wants to live in mixed neighborhoods. So I'm going mm -hmm. to find that uh, I have a, a city with mixed neighborhoods. And then you start simulating. And what you realize is that by iterating the simple rule, you end up in a situation which is not at all the one you expected. So I, I, I think that you know, that's what people call agent-based models, that in the case of shedding is, a, is the most, the simplest uh, agent-based models, but you can create more complicated agent-based models to understand how financial markets work, to, to understand macroeconomics. This is, of course, an ongoing project, and, mm -hmm. and there are, there's a lot, lot of people trying to construct these agent-based models and trying to learn something from them. And... I think the aim of these agent-based models, at least the way I see them, is not necessarily to have good models that you're going to be able to calibrate on data necessarily, but they're just you know, there to help you imagining things that you're not able to imagine mm -hmm. uh, without, uh, without help. Without, right. uh, uh, and, and so to come back to your question, I think uh, you know, deep networks are a little bit the same. They... I think they're great in helping you shaping your intuition about phenomena and discovering structures that you hadn't thought about. But um, uh, when, whereas their applications to uh, face recognition is clear and other, you know, other problems that are of uh, huge interest, like uh, diagnosis of, uh, of, of mm -hmm. uh, X-ray pictures and things like that, all this is great, but if you want to apply them to financial markets or economics as a whole, I think it's uh, you should be very careful not to uh, you know not to go too quickly and, and right, yes. not to take at face value what the what the network is telling you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and on the other end, uh, I mean, uh, do you think there are more suitable tools? For example, I saw you wrote a book about random matrix theory. Uh, ah, yes. So random matrix theory is, is another, you know, so all these deep networks, they're related to what people call high dimensional problems. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a very bad intuition of what happens in very high dimensions. And um, random matrix theory is also about high dimensions. And uh, there's a lot of very interesting phenomenon that arise in high dimensions and that you can understand using random matrix theory, for example. And actually there is, there are, seem to be very strong connections between random matrix theory and deep networks. Mm. Um, I've actually, there's a, a fantastic paper by the group of Romain Couillet in Grenoble. And I've mm. written a post on Facebook, oh no, on Facebook, sorry, on LinkedIn. I, I'm not on Facebook, <laughs> on LinkedIn um, uh, about, about these links between random matrix theory and, and deep learning. And uh, so if you, if you read the post, you'll see um, how it goes. And so for me, random matrix theory is another tool in your toolbox, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating one and a very efficient one. So for example, the way we use it in finance is that one input for risk control or for many mm -hmm. other things, by the way, but if you think about risk control, uh, you have to understand the correlation between the different things you put in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so the correlation between two things is just a one number, but the correlation between N things, N stocks or N assets is an N by N matrix. And the problem is that when the dimension of the matrix becomes large, you need a tremendous amount of data to be able to measure the true covariance matrix. Mm -hmm. If you, essentially, if you have a matrix that's a uh, thousand by a thousand, so it means that you have a thousand stock in your portfolio, say, then in order to have a very good estimate of the matrix, you need a number of observation that's much larger than a thousand. Mm -hmm. And this is problematic because a thousand days in the financial market, for example, is four years of data. So if you want to go to, say, 100 times that, and actually the problem is that the, the, the ratio that matters is 
the number of stocks over the number of observations mm -hmm. square root. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have just 10% accuracy somehow, I mean, uh, so something that's still a big error term, then you need to have 100 times more data than you have assets. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have a 1%, you need to have 10,000 more data than you have assets, which is unpractical, mm -hmm. uh, non, uh, unpractical uh, impossible to, to achieve because markets change and so on. So, so you, you're confronted with the problem of having a very noisy estimate of your covariance matrix. Mm -hmm. So is there anything you can do uh, in order to what we call clean your covariance matrix to not use the raw correlation matrix from data that you know mm -hmm. is very noisy and has a lot of biases, can you do a little better than that? So of course you will not be able to reconstruct the true correlation matrix, the true covariance matrix that's mm -hmm. behind, but you can use random matrix theory tools that are highly non-trivial and they give you these tools, they give you a recipe to clean as best as you can uh, this, uh, this, this noisy covariance matrix. And, and so that's something that we've been using for 20 years now. And that is actually operational on, on an everyday basis. So I think that random matrix theory is both intellectually beautiful and, you know, dates back to Wigner uh, in the 50s who wanted to describe the statistics of energy levels in heavy uh, nucleons, nuclei. Uh, but it has become a part of mathematics and it's also very much used in statistical physics. It's used in engineering, in communication engineering. So it's, it's a fascinating tool that is really lying at, in the middle of... Uh, many different fields and in my mind it, it you know it's it's a tool that is as useful maybe not as useful but is of similar um, impact uh, to Fourier transforms for example I mean mm -hmm. it, it's, it has big the tools that people have developed to understand these problems have now reached the level where you don't necessarily need to understand exactly the mathematics behind them, but you're, you have tools that the theory provides and that help you um, computing useful things. Mm -hmm. you know, so they become tools for the engineers, if you want. Right. Right. And is there also, maybe can you, can you explain a bit more about the, 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 the similarity with deep learning? Because I've been reading... Uh, uh, articles describing basically uh, the similarity between kernel methods and uh, deep learning. And in kernel methods, the idea is again to deal with this high dimensional yes. Hilbert spaces. Exactly. Uh, so that's matrices. precisely the point. Yes. So a kernel, so if you do a, a kernel matrix that, you know, tries to quantify the similarity between uh, observations, um, Yes. Then right. you create a random matrix, and the eigenvalue spectrum of this uh, random matrix is going to show outliers. So what you expect if you diagonalize a random matrix is to have what people call the bulk, a bulk, um, a, a range of eigenvalues which is densely populated, if you want. That the, so mm -hmm. it, that you, you form a for example, the simplest case is the Wigner case, where you have just uh, Gaussian random entries on in all um, for all elements, except that it's symmetric. And when you diagonalize this matrix, what you find is the semicircle law. So all the eigenvalues lie between minus two and two. I mean, mm -hmm. provided you normalize correctly, and the density of eigenvalues is a semicircle. So it goes to zero at minus two and at two. And you know that there's no outliers. Mm -hmm. If there are, if you diagonalize a large matrix and you see that there are outliers, then it means that your assumption that the elements are independent and uh, is wrong, and that there is some structure. But what's fascinating is that 
you really need to do this diagonalization because if you add some structure that's invisible to the human eye, so to each element, you add a bias, for example. So instead mm -hmm. of having them with zero mean, these uh, Gaussian elements, you add a, a very small bias, which is much smaller than the typical amplitude of each element. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, in the large end limit becomes precise. So you're adding a bias, but this bias is infinitely small compared to every element. So if you look at your matrix, you don't see any structure at all. Mm -hmm. But if you diagonalize this matrix, then the largest eigenvalue can pop out of the Wigner spectrum and tells you there is structure. And it mm -hmm. also tells you what kind of structure there is. And so the idea of Romain Couillet et al. that I mentioned is that, you know, if you do these kernel matrices and if you do them in an optimal way, that is you choose the kernel function optimally, then you're able to have outliers of your, when you diagonalize the matrix, you have outliers and these outliers, they tell you how to cluster your data. The mm -hmm. structure of the clustering of the data is related to the number of outliers that you're able to, you know, pop out of the of the of the random band of the band of eigenvalues that you would expect in the absence of any structure. So any outlier is giving you some indication on the on the presence of outliers, and it's 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 really striking that it works really well. I mean that mm -hmm. the, in the examples they provided, there's this one to ma one mapping between the structure of the data and the outliers of the diagonalization of these uh, random matrix, of these random matrices. So you, you're right, there's a very deep connection uh, at that level between um, right. deep learning and, uh, and these ideas of uh, outliers in random matrix theory. Mm -hmm.